Hello and welcome. It's a pleasure to be asked to talk at the uh, London Theory Institute. I am going to tell you the answer to the question, what is an anomaly? As I'm more of a physicist than a mathematician, I'm going to proceed by examples. The first part of the lecture, I have a number of quantum mechanical examples, which I hope will be uh, fun to work through. And then at the end of the lecture, I'm going to move into the field theory context, which might be more interesting to the people in the audience. All right, so let's get started. What is an anomaly? So I'll, I'll go ahead and just answer that question uh, before we do anything else. An anomaly is a classical symmetry that is broken by quantum effects. In view of many recent developments in the field, I feel like this is not a particularly good definition anymore. It's one that worked in the old days, 20, 30, 40 years ago. Uh, but as people uh, look at um, more exotic kinds of anomalies, uh, these higher form symmetry anomalies, various kinds of global anomalies, discrete anomalies, it seems to be a definition that's kind of getting stretched to its breaking point. And that's part of the reason I'd like to proceed by example, uh, so that you sort of see this a little bit of the scope of the behavior of, of, of what an anomaly is, and that may give you a better sense than a formal mathematical definition. Okay, but before we get into uh, anomalies per se, let's talk about other ways of breaking symmetries. There are usually three, three ways that uh, us physicists like to think about, three ways of breaking a symmetry. The first is explicit, the second is spontaneous, and the subject of this lecture, uh, anomalous breaking. And let's take a very simple example, actually a classical physics example, uh, to start out with and just refresh our memory of what these, these different concepts are. So a classical example. We're going to take a, a massive bead on a wire, a circular wire. So here's my circular wire. It's going to have a radius r. Here's my bead sitting on that wire, and I want to measure the angle. I'll parametrize that bead by, by an angle where it is on the wire, by an angle. It's going to have a mass m. And uh, so let's start by writing a Lagrangian for, for such a system. So the Lagrangian, as you well know from your undergraduate studies, I can write in the following form. It just has a kinetic term at this point. So theta dot is the time derivative of the angle. So it just has a basically a mass times a, a V squared term in the Lagrangian. Now, what kinds of symmetries does this system have? Well, the way I've written it, it's got two. It's got a SO2 rotational symmetry uh, under which we shift theta by a constant angle. And because alpha is constant, because alpha is constant, it doesn't affect the Lagrangian. So that's a symmetry. And there's also a Z2 reflection symmetry under which we send theta to minus theta. And then because it, the action involves just theta squared or actually theta dot squared, again, the, the Lagrangian or the action is invariant under that reflection. So we have these two nice symmetries that we can think about in this classical system. Now, the first thing I want to do is I want to break the symmetry explicitly, the rotational symmetry anyway. So an explicit breaking, we will introduce a gravitational field parameterized by that acceleration, g, and we'll also uh, spin the uh, wire around its vertical axis. So we're going to introduce a rotation omega of the wire, so it's going to be spinning like this. And when I do this, the Lagrangian is going to change. It's going to develop some potential terms. So I still have the kinetic piece, and I'll develop a potential term due to the spinning. I guess I can also think about that as a kinetic term, uh, but since, uh, you know, I'm doing this kind of externally, I'm externally rotating it. I can think about it maybe more accurately as a potential. And I also have a potential due to the gravitational field, mgr cosine theta. And you notice when I've added these potential terms, I no longer have uh, the rotational symmetry. So the rotational symmetry is broken explicitly. However, the way I've done this, I've, I still have a z2 reflection symmetry uh, that's preserved. The potential hasn't hasn't broken that yet, okay? So explicitly, I can break the symmetries uh, just by adding extra terms in the action or the Lagrangian. So the next uh, thing we want to do is we want to break that symmetry spontaneously. So spontaneous breaking. And this is going to happen dynamically. This happens when the ground state of the system does not preserve the symmetry of the Lagrangian or the Hamiltonian. So the ground state does not preserve the symmetry of L. 
or more generally S. So let's see what happens with this case. Uh, so let's, let's copy that uh, Lagrangian from the previous page. So there it is. And I want to look for a ground state or the lowest energy state. So in the lowest energy, uh, I won't have any kinetic energy. So let's set theta dot equal to zero. And to satisfy the equations in motion, then I need to make sure that dl d theta equals zero. Or in this particular example, I need to see that um, m omega squared r squared sine theta cosine theta minus m g r sine theta equals zero. Or we can simplify that a little, little bit. The, the equivalent condition is that sine theta times uh, omega squared r over g cosine theta minus one equals zero. And so there, there are clearly two, two solutions here. To find a critical point, we can set theta equal to zero, or actually more generally pi times some integer, although we're gonna find that the zero one is the minimum. And another case uh, that we can do is we can set cosine theta equal to g over omega squared r, which of course only makes sense if that constant on the right-hand side there is less than one. Okay, so let's draw the potential in these two cases and we'll see, we'll see what's going on. It really is basically like that Mexican hat potential you're, you're familiar with from the usual uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking example. Okay, so here's case one, omega squared r over g less than one. So there's no solution for that cosine. And lo and behold, there's a single minimum, stable minimum for the, you know, the mass sitting at the bottom of the ring. And then there's another case if it's spinning fast enough where I do have a solution for that cosine, omega squared r over g is greater than one. So here we draw it again. And now there's a pair of minima and the bead should choose one of them. And when it does, because now I've broken that theta to minus theta symmetry, that remaining discrete symmetry that wasn't broken explicitly, I have spontaneous symmetry breaking. All right. This is probably familiar uh, to many of you. Maybe I'll make that bead a little bit clearer, make it red sitting there at the bottom. I wanna make a few remarks uh, before I, I move on here. Remark one, this has been a classical analysis. Uh, if we were to look at this quantum mechanically, there's no spontaneous symmetry breaking. And why is that? Well, it's because the ground state, GS for ground state, I could take as a, as a superposition of, maybe this is not an exact statement, but it's, it's almost true in the limit where the potentials are, uh, the, the minima are well separated. I take that sort of classical minima on the left and that classical minima on the right, and I take a linear superposition of those two classical minima, and that's a, a very good approximation to the true ground state. That there's some tunneling between these two minima uh, that can lower the energy. So that's the quantum mechanical uh, situation. We can also think about quantum field theory situation. In that case, we do have spontaneous symmetry breaking. The reason for that is that we want to promote theta of x to a field of some you know, auxiliary set of variables, not just time. And now because this field exists throughout space, it's too hard to tunnel all at once. Uh, and there's no good way for the system uh, to reduce its energy by taking this linear superposition. Now, the remainder of this, this first part of the lecture, I want to give you a, a more complicated example where uh, anomalies actually are able to guarantee a degenerate ground state. This is gonna be a related quantum mechanical example as we go forward where anomalies guarantee a degenerate ground state. So this is maybe much less familiar. Good, okay, so that's the introduction of my lecture and now we're gonna move into our first real example of an anomaly. We're gonna stick with this bead. We're gonna make the bead charged and we're gonna introduce a magnetic field. And the kind of picture I want you to have in mind is here's my bead on the circular wire. And in the center of the system, I'm gonna introduce a constant B field, some magnetic flux through the center. So where the bead is moving, there's actually not gonna be any magnetic field at all. Uh, but because there's that magnetic field in the center, there's actually gonna be some effect on the wire, residual effect. It's like an Aharonov, it is an Aharonov bohm effect. Uh, so in this case, the bead doesn't experience a magnetic field, but it does experience a vector potential. So I'll introduce the parameter gamma, which is gonna be uh, proportional to this vector potential. And in the situation where the magnetic field is inside the loop, uh, it's gonna be constant. And I'm gonna assign an exercise a little bit later on where you can work out some of the details of this for yourself. But for the moment, let's just take for granted uh, that the system is described by the following classical Lagrangian. So I have my old 
kinetic term, one half theta dot squared, there should be an m and an r there also. But let's just set that to one to make our lives simple. And now I have the effect of uh, my magnetic field, which I'm going to parameterize with this constant gamma. All right. Sorry, this should be squared, of course. One half theta dot squared. It's still a kinetic term. So again, this is a constant B field inside the wire. All right, so let's talk about symmetries. I still have rotation because the Lagrangian only depends on the derivative of the angle. So I have a rotation SO2 under which I can send theta to theta plus, let's call it delta, the shift. And what about that reflection uh, we talked about before, the Z2 symmetry? Well, that seems to be broken, but it turns out that for certain specific choices of gamma, I can keep the Z2. So if I tune that magnetic flux through the loop in exactly the right way, so that gamma takes on uh, the right set of values, uh, I'm still going to have a Z2. So let's see how that works. This is a quantum effect now. So this is one way in which this um, you know, definition about classical symmetries being destroyed by quantum effects gets a little bit sloppy already, because this Z2 symmetry is now already only sort of there because of quantum effects. But let's, let's just see how it works. So we need to broaden our perspective here to see how this reflection symmetry uh, persists. So what's our quantum perspective? Let's talk about the path integral. So the path integral for this theory, right, I have to integrate over all possible configurations, uh, angular configurations. I've got an integral e to the i l of t dt. And now from this perspective, it's clear that for, the, for there to be a symmetry in the path integral, l of t dt doesn't need to be invariant, but it does need to be invariant up to a shift of uh, by two pi times an integer. So it needs to be invariant only up to a shift by 2 pi times an integer. Okay, that's the first non-trivial uh, statement that's a little bit outside the classical scope here. It's something that's coming from, from quantum effects, from the path integral. And now there's another key assumption, which from time to time makes me unhappy when I think too carefully about it. But here it is. It's a, it's a very powerful assumption. It's very useful in many cases. It's an assumption that the theory should make sense on any space. So the space here is just the time coordinate, and we're used to thinking about time as just some you know, line, some linear variable. Uh, but here, what I want to do is I want to think about it not as a, a linear variable, but I want to compactify time. I want to identify time up to a shift by some constant t. So now I'm on a loop, and I want to claim that my theory should make sense on this space. So in order for that to be true, you know, theta also is an angular variable. It means that if I evaluate theta at t, so I, you know, I go around the loop, I better come back to the same angle. But of course, since the angles only define modulo 2 pi times an integer, uh, I only need to get back to myself up to 2 pi times that integer. Okay, so if that's true, now let's analyze this problematic term that seems to be breaking that reflection symmetry. So I had this gamma theta dot term, which doesn't seem to behave well under theta goes to minus theta. Uh, it's a total derivative since gamma is a constant, so I can evaluate it now on my compact time circle. And what do I find? I find that I'm going to get gamma times 2 pi times that integer n. Okay, so what does this mean? This means that if I shift gamma to gamma plus 1, this is a, a sort of a symmetry. This is a sort of a symmetry of the, of the theory. I'll put it in quotes since maybe it doesn't fit with all the sort of standard uh, definitions of a symmetry that you're used to, but it takes the theory back to itself. It just shifts the path integral by this phase. Uh, and so it, it, it leaves things invariant. So if you've, if you've had a, a good quantum field theory course and you've talked about QCD and Yang-Mills theory, you may have seen something very similar to that, uh, to, to what we're discussing here in that context. You might have seen this theta angle term um, this f wedge f uh, times a constant theta, which also has a sort of similar symmetry because f wedge f gets quantized in a similar way. So th there's some very close connections between that, that system and this. Okay, so that was a sort of quantum perspective interlude. And now let's get back to this reflection symmetry. Is it there or isn't it there? Back to z2. So I want to send theta to minus theta. So what does this imply about the shift of that problematic gamma theta dot uh, dt term? Uh, well, it's just going to be uh, 2 because I'm going from theta to minus theta. So I pick up a factor of 2 times gamma times 2 pi n when I do this integral, you know, knowing that, you know, it's a total derivative and theta has to be periodic as I go around the circle. 
So in order for this to be a pure phase, in order for this, uh, this Z2 to be a symmetry, I find uh, I have a symmetry for two cases, gamma an integer or gamma a half integer. And then because I have this sort of symmetry in quotes under shifts of gamma from shifts of gamma by an integer from one to two to three to four, really there's only basically two cases to analyze. All the others are equivalent. There's the simplest case where gamma is zero and there's the slightly more complicated case where gamma is a half, okay? So the claim is in these two special cases and all cases related to those by shifts of integers, this uh, Z2 symmetry is still there in this sort of secret quantum way. But it's not there comfortably. There's an anomaly. Uh, it's a special kind of anomaly, often called a Tuft anomaly. There is a Tuft anomaly with the Z2. And in fact, it's not really possible to separate it from the rotational symmetry either. It kind of the Tuft anomaly you know, inextricably mixes these two in this kind of problematic way, as, as, we'll, see, as we'll see in a moment. So what is a Tuft anomaly? These are anomalies that show up in global symmetry. So these are global symmetries, these Z2 and SO2, when you try to gauge them. So what do I mean gauge a global symmetry? Well, I mean, instead of, so for the rotational symmetry, instead of meaning that I shift theta by the same amount for all time, I want to shift it in an amount which depends where I am, or where I am in time. And when I do that, in order to compensate for that time dependence in the shift, I need to introduce an external gauge field. And the way this works is that uh, I see the anomaly when I turn on these external gauge fields. So let, let's, see, let's see how this works. So let's gauge the SO2 rotational symmetry. So I have a DDT, and it's going to become a covariant derivative after this weak gauging. So instead of DDT, I'm going to have DDT minus a gauge connection, A of T. Uh, this has nothing to do with the you know, magnetic field I was talking about before that I was using to set up the system. So under this, I can shift theta to theta plus delta of t now, delta is a function of t, and to compensate that time dependence, I now have to shift um, the vector potential in a time-dependent way as well as the time derivative of that delta of t. And of course, in this combination, then the covariant derivative uh, becomes gauge invariant, doesn't shift under this, this combined shift of a and theta. Okay, so let's see what happens to L under this shift. I think I should start a new uh, sheet of paper here. So L, under this weak gauging, wherever I had a time derivative, I now also have to include this vector potential. So the kinetic term gets an extra piece. Uh, this gamma term gets an extra piece. And now it turns out it's useful to add one more piece here that depends just on the vector potential. This is what's called a counter term. And it would be very nice to do this in some kind of gauge invariant way. So let's think about whether uh, this addition here is, is gauge invariant. Uh, before we do anything else. So what, what changes under gauge transformation? So if I take delta of this, delta of k, a of t, dt in the action, I can write this as minus integral k delta prime of t dt, which is minus k delta of capital T minus delta of zero. Again, thinking that I'm living on some compact time circle. And then finally, I get minus k 2 pi n, because I, I, I'd better shift things in a you know, a way that's compatible with the periodicity. And if I'm going to shift theta by this gauge parameter delta of t, by the time I go around the circle, I better shifted um, the angular variable by, you know, 2 pi times some, some integer, I, or I'm not back where I started. It doesn't make sense. I don't have a good winding number for the, for the theta angle. Okay, and now for this to be a phase in the path integral, for this to be a pure phase, for this to be a pure phase, uh, I, I must require that k is also an integer. So I can add this counter term in a gauge invariant way, but k must be an integer. What happens to the z2 now that I've gauged the rotational symmetry? So I had a theta goes to minus theta. So now this looks uh, really bad. It doesn't look like the same Lagrangian at all, but maybe what I should do is I should supplement this symmetry transformation on theta with a symmetry transformation on the vector potential, since it's a new object. It wasn't there before. Maybe it also should transform under this, under this z2. So let's send it to minus a of t. That seems reasonable. Seems like some kind of charge conjugation, maybe, in a more traditional context, where you're like taking a complex conjugate of the field. Theta is really the phase of some field, so complex conjugate sends theta to minus theta. And it also, there's a charge multiplying the vector potential, so that charge got sent to minus q. So it's really sort of like a, a charge conjugation. Anyway, what happens when I do this? Well, 
the, uh, the first term, the kinetic term, is fine, right, because it's quadratic. Uh, but this gamma term is, is a little bit problematic. You know, we, we already discussed how this gamma theta dot piece is okay, because it's just going to shift by a total phase. But now we have a new piece here, this vector potential piece, which doesn't look like it's going to behave well under this shift. So let, let's, let's see what's going to go, go wrong here. So when I, when I do this shift, I'm going to pick up two contributions. I'm going to pick up a contribution from this gamma term, and I'm going to pick up a contribution from the uh, counter term, integral a of t dt. This will be my shift in the action. And now it's no longer clear that you know, the integral of a t should be quantized in any nice way. And so in order for this to vanish, I, I really need this, this uh, combination gamma plus k to vanish. Uh, but I can only arrange this in one case, right? I mean, I, I, in, order, in order to arrange this to work, I need to, um, I need to be able to set gamma equal to minus k, and I can only do this if gamma is an integer. If gamma is uh, not an integer, I, you know, in order to preserve gauge invariance, k has to be an integer. So I'm faced with this rather annoying choice. I can either uh, preserve the gauge invariance or I can preserve the z2, but I can't do both at the same time. So if gamma is an in, uh, integer plus a half, there's no way to choose uh, k consistent with gauge invariance. This is the anomaly. So if this sort of path integral Lagrangian approach to it was a little bit uh, uncomfortable, I'd like to kind of revisit things uh, from a more traditional Hamiltonian quantum mechanics uh, viewpoint now, which hopefully will, will shed a little bit more light on this example and also show us how anomalies can give us degenerate ground states in quantum mechanics. So we had our Lagrangian, one half theta dot squared minus gamma theta dot, and we need a Hamiltonian. So let's see how that works. So we've got a, a conjugate momentum P, which is dl d theta dot. That's nothing but theta dot minus gamma. And so our Hamiltonian, which is P theta dot minus L, that's also known as theta dot minus gamma times theta dot, uh, minus one half theta dot squared plus gamma theta dot. And the only thing that's left over uh, when the dust settles is one half theta dot squared. So that's our, that's our Hamiltonian, but of course we need to express it in terms of the, the conjugate momentum, uh, which in this case is uh, P plus gamma, right? So I'm going to get from my Hamiltonian P, P plus gamma squared uh, times a half. And, and I have a little exercise uh, for you, the first of many, uh, which is to derive this Hamiltonian from the physics of a charged bead moving around some magnetic flux and also constrained to, constrained to this, uh, this circular wire. So the idea of this exercise is to you know, try and figure out what, what the constants are, is to figure out how the magnetic field and the charge and the mass and the radii uh, go into uh, setting the constants in this Hamiltonian. All right, but anyway, that's, that's an aside. We have this Hamiltonian, we can use it, and we'll promote it to a, a quantum mechanical one, an operator on a Hilbert space. Uh, we'll, we'll trade in our momentum uh, for a theta derivative. This is the uh, momentum, angular momentum going around the ring, and that, that, that's just controlled by this, this dd theta term if I you know, set the masses and so forth in an appropriate way. Okay, so this is the Hamiltonian like, I'd like to use. So the first job is to figure out the spectrum and the eigenstates. So I claim that the, uh, the spectrum has a, a relatively simple form. It's just uh, an integer plus this gamma squared. So these are, these are my energies, I'll call them En, comma gamma, and my wave functions, theta n, my normalized wave functions, they're just uh, plane waves going around the ring. And n here is any integer, positive or negative, including zero. So this is, this is a way of diagonalizing my, my Hamiltonian. And I, I've set this, of course, by, by insisting on periodic boundary conditions for my wave function that I you know, go around the, the circle and I get back to where I started. So the first thing I want to note about the spectrum is that it has a, a sort of self-similarity or a symmetry that if I shift n down by one and I shift gamma up by one, I get the same energy back. And so <clears throat> this is a, a, another manifestation of what we saw a few pages before, that gamma goes to gamma plus one 
is a symmetry of the system, and particularly here it's a symmetry of the spectrum of states of the Hilbert space. Of course, I require here having an infinite set of states. You know, it goes all the way from you know, n equals minus infinity to n equals plus infinity. So gamma goes to gamma plus one is a, a symmetry of the spectrum of states. So now let's think about how our Z2 symmetry and our rotational symmetry act on the spectrum, okay? So for rotation, let's introduce uh, the generator R alpha as a shift on theta by a constant alpha, and I'll introduce a reflection Z2, we'll call that C, maybe to suggest charge conjugation as theta goes to minus theta. So this is clearly a symmetry, the rotational one. And, and the Z2 one, of course, is, is not obviously a symmetry. This is a more subtle uh, a case. It's, it's only sort of clearly a symmetry when gamma is zero, and the, uh, the Hamiltonian is then quadratic in, in theta dot. Uh, but the claim is that it's also uh, going to be a symmetry uh, when, when gamma is half integer. So how do we set things up? The action on states, so R alpha is going to shift theta by alpha, and so it, it shifts the state by a phase, e to the i and alpha times n. Now when gamma equals zero, C acting on the state n pretty clearly produces the state minus n. Uh, to get a symmetry on the set of states when gamma is equal to half, I've got to do something a little bit more uh, tricky. I've got to set n to minus n, but also shift by one. And the claim is under this additional shift by one, I can see that all the states uh, are paired up in this way. That I'm, I'm shifting a state to another state with the same energy. And in particular, I've got two degenerate ground states in here, zero and one uh, are degenerate ground states. All right, now our external gauge field argument from a few pages ago, that there was some kind of anomaly, some kind of Tuft anomaly, it suggested uh, a non-trivial interplay between the rotation and the charge conjugation, at least when gamma was half integer. So let, let's see what happens. So if I take gamma equals zero, and let's see what happens if I act with C R alpha C. So I conjugate the rotation by the action of the C2 symmetry. So this should work, There'd be nothing subtle here. So I go C R alpha, I get minus N. I act again with the rotation, I get C minus I alpha N minus N. And then I act one final time with C and I get E to the minus I alpha N N. I can just commute the C through the phase. And this is the same as the action of R of minus alpha on N, which is you know, consistent with uh, you know, our, our geometric intuition for what should be going on here. Now, if I take gamma equals one half instead, and I go through the same exercise, now I get R alpha minus N plus one, C E to the minus N plus one, and then the state is still minus N plus one. And then I act again with C, I'm gonna get E, minus n plus one alpha i n. So I get the original state back again after acting with c twice. c should square to the identity. And this I can interpret as e to the alpha i r to the minus alpha n. So I don't quite get what I would expect geometrically. I don't quite get the opposite rotation, rotation by minus alpha. I get that up to this phase e to the alpha i. So what does this mean? It means basically I have different groups here. At gamma equals zero I have more or less exactly what I would expect, SO2 cross Z2 combined to give me some double cover of SO2, I get O2. But at gamma equals a half, there's this new central element. I call it central because it's just a phase. It, uh, it commutes with everything else. It's just E to the I alpha. And well, we could try to define it away, see what happens. Maybe we could define a different rotation element, R alpha tilde, which is R alpha e to the minus i alpha over two. And then indeed, when I do this conjugation, c r to alpha tilde c, I get r minus alpha tilde without that extra phase, which is, which is what I'd, I'd like. But now a rotation by two pi is no longer the identity, it's minus one. So I've got to go around two pi and then another two pi to make four pi to get the identity. So what I'm, I'm finding here is I'm finding a double cover of O2, which has a name, it's called pin two. And so indeed in this gamma equals a half case, there is some non-trivial interplay uh, between these two groups, the reflection symmetry and the, and the SO2 symmetry. Uh, so this is another manifestation of the anomaly, although again, you sort of see the difficulty with this initial statement of what an anomaly is, that a classical symmetry that's broken by uh, quantum effects 
here in this discrete context where some of the symmetries are discrete, one could arguably say that I'm, I'm not reducing the symmetry, I'm, I'm finding more symmetry, I'm finding some enhanced group, although that's not, not quite the right way to describe what's going on. Okay, so we're almost at this point about degenerate ground state, so let's, let's get there. So we don't need the full SO2 to talk about this anomaly. We could just keep a Z2 in the SO2, just say a rotation by pi. And the way we'll do that is we'll, we'll, we'll have some explicit breaking, like we did in the original example in these lecture notes where we have this you know, gravitational potential and the, the spinning wire. So we can imagine adding uh, a bunch of uh, cosine terms. And I'm gonna do it in a special way. I'm gonna add only uh, even integers. And if I do it in this way, I'm gonna preserve uh, both the reflection symmetry and this remaining Z2 uh, symmetry in the rotation group where I shift by pi. And now we have our second exercise, which is to show that these three elements, e to the i pi, the central element, a rotation by pi, and this uh, charge conjugation, or Z2, that the three of them together generate uh, the dihedral group D8. And then what we see here now is that because we have this group with uh, irreducible representations that are larger than one dimensional, we see that the, you know, these three elements, e, e to the i pi, r pi, and c, they act on our degenerate ground state in this, you know, gamma equals one half case as a two-dimensional irreducible representation of D8. So there's some consequences of this. One is that there's no way for the degeneracy to be lifted, no way consistent with the symmetry. So as long as that D8 symmetry is there, I have a degenerate ground state. And uh, this usual story of a unique ground state in quantum mechanics fails. You can look at more detail in this, in this uh, example and the, the tunneling, uh, the tunneling amplitudes between these two, uh, these two degenerate ground states, uh, it vanishes. Now, you know, what happens in the usual case, right? I just maybe have a Z2 uh, symmetry uh, acting on the ground states. So I just have say two, I just have say two ground states which are, which are equivalent. And Z2 of course has only one dimensional irreducible representations and so I can, you know, if I have those two states, I can make a lower, lower energy state by forming some combinations, which give me one dimensional representations of the Z2. But here, since the ground state transforms under this two dimensional representation, nothing I can do. I'm, I'm guaranteed to have this degenerate ground state. So I, that brings me to the end of the first part of this lecture. And uh, I wanted to make a few remarks about why I went through this example in such detail. So I, I drew it largely from a reference by Gaiato, Kapustin, Komargotsky, and uh, Seiberg. So if you didn't like the way I discussed it, you can find a nice uh, patient discussion in their appendix, I think Appendix D, uh, where they go through this, this same example. And the reason they went through this seemingly simple example is they were interested in applications uh, to Yang-Mills theory and QCD. So there's a lot of similarity here between uh, this parameter gamma and the, and the theta angle in Yang-Mills theory. And they're able to bootstrap off this simple quantum mechanics example and deduce, uh, they're able to deduce aspects of the phase diagram for, uh, for Yang-Mills. And optimistically, maybe you could push this a little bit further and talk about QCD as well. All right, so that brings me to the end of the first, uh, first major example in this lecture. If you stay around, uh, I'm going to discuss another quantum mechanics example next, and we're going to start talking about uh, my favorite kind of anomalies, which are anomalies in scale symmetry. So this is the second example in this lecture. It's going to be an example of a scaling anomaly, uh, an anomaly in the scaling symmetry, and it will be again a quantum mechanics example. Now, these scaling anomalies are uh, much closer to my heart than the anomaly uh, we just discussed in, in the, last, uh, the last half hour or so. Uh, these are kind of anomalies that I've uh, looked at in, in great detail in my own research, and so I'm looking forward to sharing a, a particularly simple example of uh, its manifestation as we go forward. So here goes, scaling symmetry anomaly in quantum mechanics. All right, so here's my uh, Schrodinger equation that I wanna solve going to be a 2D scattering uh, problem. So I have a kinetic term and I have a very simple potential term. It's going to be a Dirac delta function 
and I've written it with a negative sign there because I have in mind at the end of the day this lambda is going to be a, a positive quantity. So it's going to be attractive uh, delta function. So that acts on my wave function, psi of r, and it's going to spit out, <clears throat> if I have an eigenstate, an energy e times psi of r again. Now, a curious thing about this particular uh, Schrodinger problem is that it's invariant under scaling, at least naively. So it's invariant under uh, rescaling the position by a constant a, and at the same time rescaling the energy by 1 over a squared. So what does this mean? Uh, well, from a quantum mechanics point of view, it's a little bit sick. Uh, there's going to be a continuous spectrum. You know, if we have some energy state, we have all other possible energy states related by uh, rescaling by this positive number a squared. In fact, if there exists a single bound state with negative energy, we're in trouble because then the Hamiltonian's un unbounded below. There's a continuum and the energy, energy is, can, can run off to minus infinity. So that's something that we need to uh, be a little careful about moving forward. So let's try to reveal the anomalous uh, behavior of the system through a scattering experiment. And to do that, I need to review a few facts about scattering and quantum mechanics, which uh, if you're like me, uh, you studiously ignored uh, the first time you took a quantum mechanics uh, class. So the first thing to do is a review of 2D scattering off a localized potential in quantum mechanics. So this is almost certainly something you didn't do in the main, in the main lecture in a quantum mechanics course. If you took one of my courses, you may have seen it in a homework assignment, but uh, usually people only talk about 3D scattering or maybe 1D scattering, very rarely 2D scattering, and then often it's skipped entirely. So anyway, let's, let's talk about 2D scattering. So I'm going to write a form, asymptotic form for the wave function. So I have my incoming plane wave. I'm going to send in some incoming plane wave in the x direction, and it will scatter out in a way that depends on the angle. In 3D, there'd be an extra angle, potentially if the, if the potential wasn't symmetric. Here I just have an angle, one angle describing, one polar angle describing the angle around the, around the target, and a radial out, radially outgoing wave. So this is incoming. This is my boundary condition, if you will. And this is what happens. This is the scattered, scattered stuff coming out. So a couple of remarks about uh, this particular asymptotic form. So this is a, a large R form for my wave function. First remark is that this f of theta has a classical interpretation as a differential scattering cross section. Its amplitude, if I take f of theta absolute value squared, uh, this is the differential scattering cross section. Let's think about that e to the i k r piece that I wrote down. The presence of k in the exponent, this is indicating I have energy conservation. So I have the same energy waves going in as going out. Remember, far from the potential, I should be back to a free theory. And so the energy is just you know, h bar squared k squared over 2m. So I should find the same energy in, this, in, this, uh, in these particles that I send in that, I, that, that come out. And then finally, that 1 over root r, uh, this is just probability conservation. I want to make sure when I integrate a shell around the target that, you know, I've got the same amount going in as going out. And so that you know, 1 over root r squares to make 1 over r, which cancels the you know, growth in the area uh, of, a, of, a, of a spherical shell, right? Okay, so we're going to solve this Schrodinger problem. That was my review. Now we're going to solve this Schrodinger problem in momentum space. So I have my Fourier transform my Fourier transform wave function, which I'm going to write as d2x, d to the minus i p dot x, psi of x. Remember, I'm in two dimensions here. It's because of this transformation of the delta function, right? If I were in 3 or 1, then I wouldn't have the scale invariant. So this, this you know, scaling is a peculiar uh, feature of uh, the 2D system for the delta function potential. All right, and so what do I get? I get p squared over 2m for the kinetic piece in the Schrodinger equation. When I go and Fourier transform that delta function, I just get lambda, I get a direct delta function. I get to evaluate the direct delta function at r equals 0, and so I get the un-Fourier transformed wave function evaluated at 0. And on the right-hand side, I get the energy, right, which I said was h-bar k squared over 2m, and I'm just going to set h-bar equal to 1 here so I don't have to worry about it. So there's my Schrodinger equation in momentum space. So now I can solve this for psi, and there's a piece that's easy to see is there. This is just solving it algebraically, but there's also kind of a kernel here. Uh, and so there's a little bit of flexibility in how I solve it. 
uh, I'm free to put in a, a kind of hom homogeneous part um, that's going to give me the right boundary conditions. So I can put in a p minus k delta function that gets annihilated by this, uh, this equation on the, on the second line. And I'm putting this in to get out my incoming plane wave, to get the boundary conditions, to get the e to the i k x behavior. Right, so my k uh, vector, that's a vector that I've chosen to be in the x direction, and it's, it's pick, picking the incoming wave that's scattering off my potential. Okay, so here's my solution in momentum space, and now I Fourier transform back. I get psi of r equals e to the i kx plus 2m lambda psi of 0 integral d 2p 2 pi squared plane weight factor p squared minus k squared. So that formally is my solution. And now there's some problems with it, as we'll see uh, going forward. So let, let's copy that and, and go to the next page here. So this needs to be consistent, right? There's a psi on both sides of the equation. So let's, let's make sure we can have a consistent solution here. So evaluate it at zero. What do we get? We get psi of zero equals one plus two m lambda psi of zero integral d two p over 2 pi squared, 1 over p squared minus k squared. Now this looks problematic because that integral is log divergent. So we're cruising along nicely. We've done the Fourier transform. We Fourier transform back. We found a potential solution. And now consistency is getting us in trouble. We're finding this integral over all of the states uh, that, that's, that's log divergent. So we need some way uh, to deal with this. I mean, we can throw up our hands and say, well, it was a sick theory. Uh, or we can say, well, maybe maybe we can still save it. Maybe we can regulate it in some way that won't affect the physics too much. So what we're going to do here is we're going to regulate uh, with a cutoff. We're only going to integrate up to momenta less than lambda. And when we do this, uh, we can evaluate the integral. It's just logarithm. We get 1 over 4 pi natural log lambda squared minus k squared over minus k squared. And we're almost done now. So that, that, that gives us psi of zero. And now we also need a solution. And to get the solution, we still need to do the full integral. Well, I'll just point out before we leave, of course, that you know, introducing this cutoff also introduces a scale. This is our anomaly. This is our scale anomaly that we're, you know, quantum effects, doing this, this quantum mechanical scattering effect. We find this infinite integral over momenta over the states, uh, to be able to deal with this, we have to introduce a scale. Okay, but let's keep going. Let's, let's, let's see what happens. Maybe we can make a little bit more sense of this going forward. Let's try and get, get this full integral done and, and, and find a solution. So we have integral d2p over 2 pi squared e to the i p dot r over p squared minus k squared. So the usual way to do this is to go to polar coordinates, or at least the way I typically do it. I still have that factor of 2 pi squared from the momenta integral, and now I have e to the i p r cosine theta over p squared minus k squared. So the theta integral can be done to give a Bessel, and then the Bessel can be done to give a Henkel function. It's a little bit of work. I leave it as an exercise, although not a formal one. And here's my outgoing Henkel function um, that comes out of the integral. It's good it's outgoing, right? Because we want the waves to scatter off of this off of this target. And to compare with this, you know, asymptotic form for the wave function that we had before that had this f of theta, we should look at the large r behavior. And when we do that, we find 1 over 2 square root 2 pi e to the i k r plus i pi over 4 square root of k r. And so what does this imply? This implies f of theta just reading off, comparing, you know, the form of the wave function we found to the form we wrote down at the beginning, that this scattering amplitude is m, m lambda and the numerator, 2 pi k square root and the denominator, the value of the wave function at, at the origin, e to the i pi over 4. So a couple of remarks. There's no theta dependence. This is pure S wave scattering, as you might expect. I mean, it's a delta function. There's no breaking of the angular symmetry. So what goes in gets scattered out in a theta independent way. Um, and then the second comment is that there's a pole in the scattering amplitude in f of theta. There's a pole in f of theta because there's also a pole in psi of zero, as we saw on the previous slide, and that this indicates a bound state. At least that's the usual, that's the usual logic. So let's, let's look at that. So 
if I go back a page, if I go back a page, you know, you see, you see what we had here. We had psi of zero uh, expressed implicitly, and we had the value of the integral worked out. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to, you know, move psi to one side, the integral to the other, and, and we'll see what psi looks like uh, on, on, on the next page. So here I am, I'm, I'm you know, solving for psi of zero now, writing down the answer in terms of our cutoff that we added by hand. And indeed, right, we see that there's some kind of pole here for s specific values of k. There's a pole at k squared equals lambda squared over one minus e to the two pi over m lambda. Uh, and so this is gonna be a bound state, k squared less than zero for m lambda greater than than zero, which as I discussed at the beginning was an attractive delta function, that positive lambda corresponded to an attractive delta function. Uh, for uh, m lambda repulsive, this is attractive, which is m lambda less than zero, you're free to send, you're free to send the cutoff off to infinity and uh, psi of zero uh, to zero and um, no scattering. So the, the, the repulsive case, the repulsive delta function case is, is sort of consistent with scaling symmetry. Uh, but for the attractive case, it seems like, you know, to make sense of it, um, you'll find potentially this, this bound state, which gives you a resonance in the scattering. So indeed, we can trade lambda for the bound state energy, which, you know, if we're actually trying to uh, model something experimentally, maybe we can, this can be experimental input. And then hopefully, you know, just with these couple parameters, you have a good model of your system. Or alternatively, maybe you have a different way of thinking about the delta function at very short distance scale. So remember, this is a product. Uh, this is a problem when, when the momentum goes off to infinity, or, or cor correspondingly, when you you're probing distances that are very very close to this Dirac delta function. And you know, physically, it's a bit of a singular object, right? This Dirac delta function. So. Maybe if you're actually modeling some real physical system you have in mind, it has some width. Maybe it actually looks like a little well or something, which might actually have a bound state. And so by adding in those microscopic details, you could add microscopic details to the model, replace your delta function with something a little bit more physical, and then the bound state, you could, you could calculate the bound state energy. So there's kind of two different perspectives on, on what to do here either experimental input, you just think about um, this pole is coming from ex some experimentally measured bound state, or you have a better microscopic description of your system. Anyway, so the moral here is the following, at least the moral I take away from it, that the quantum theory is a bit sick. Uh, and to make sense of it, we need to introduce a scale, either from some experimental measurement or from improving the theory in some other way to obviate the need uh, for this anomalous scale breaking. Very good. So that's my second example. And uh, when I continue, uh, we're going to talk about uh, field theory. We're going to talk about scale anomalies, and, and more specifically, anomalies in the trace of the stress tensor in a quantum field theory context. So now for the third example in this lecture, we're going to talk about the trace anomaly, which is a form of scaling anomaly in a quantum field theory. A very simple quantum field theory. It's going to be a two-dimensional massless scalar field, uh, but it's a very informative example, and uh, I look forward to showing you the details. So here we go, a QFT example. We're going to be in two dimensions. I'll put a factor of a half because of convention, d2x uh, d mu phi d mu phi. That's my action. Now the claim is that this is scale invariant. If I send uh, a position to lambda times the position, so I scale the distances between all points in the system in a, in a constant way, so lambda is going to be a constant. Uh, the claim is that this action is invariant because, well, the, you know, the, the derivative factors have a 1 over x, two of them in fact, two derivatives have two 1 over x factors, and the d2x in the integrand cancels it, so the lambda dependence cancels out. Uh, this theory is scale invariant. So that's a sort of global scale invariance. And there's an idea here, it's you know, akin to that idea I talked about at the beginning about being able to define a theory on any space-time, not just flat space. So here we started in flat space, could be flat Euclidean, could be flat Lorentzian, but there's an idea we should be able to promote that to a theory on any space and have some kind of cousin of that same scaling symmetry. So let, let's see how that might work here. So we have S uh, is going to be one half, and now if I'm going to talk about any space, I need to introduce some kind of metric. So G is my metric, G with upper indices is my inverse metric, 
d mu phi d nu phi. So it's the same theory now in a curved space time. And I've written this in a, a diffeomorphism invariant way so that you know, it doesn't matter what coordinate system I, I use, I should find the same theory out again. And now under that same scaling, what am I going to find? So g mu nu is going to transform under, under this scaling. It's a, it's a form of diffeomorphism. x mu goes to x prime mu is going to be lambda x mu. And what's my rule? Well, the primed metric I can write in terms of a Jacobian factor acting on the original unprimed metric, uh, which in this particular case, if I've done my algebra right, it's 1 over lambda squared uh, g mu nu, because why? Well, because, right, this, these derivatives dx alpha dx prime mu, these are just Kronecker delta functions uh, with an extra inverse factor of that scaling constant lambda. So the metric transforms now. So I've added all these metric factors. I should be careful that the, I still have this scaling symmetry. Let's see what happens. So conveniently, the determinant of the metric has two factors of that lambda because there's a two-dimensional uh, metric. And the inverse metric transforms in the opposite way as lambda squared instead of 1 over lambda squared. So this, this combination doesn't transform. Because why? Because g prime upper mu nu is lambda squared g upper mu nu, and det g prime is lambda inverse squared det g. And so the factors of lambda cancel out. This is an example of a more general kind of theory on a curved space time. It's an example of a vial invariant theory, at least classically. And that's going to be the whole point that we're going to see a breaking of the symmetry quantum mechanically, an anomalous breaking. So what I mean by a vial transformation, I want to shift the metric by some factor. And in fact, it's convenient to make this local too, to make that function omega not just a constant now, but a, fa a function of, of space-time. And you know, that's sort of more physical, right? It seems sort of unphysical to kind of a-causally transform all of space at once. You could imagine locally scaling things um, and still hoping for it to be a symmetry. Uh, and then, you know, that, that information that you rescale things locally could then propagate out. So it's, it's a very simple example, this 2D massless scalar field. There's a, a more general set of scalar fields, so-called conformally coupled scalar fields. And I'll leave that as an exercise to you. It doesn't work quite as nicely in more than two dimensions. This is the conformally coupled scalar field. That if I write S equals, let's put a one half there again, integral d dx. Now I'm in d dimensions. I still have that square root of g determinant of g, and I'm going to have uh, d phi squared plus a constant c, which I'm going to ask you to determine the Ricci scalar, and phi squared again. And the claim is that this is, again, vial invariant, uh, if I scale now phi as well. So I didn't have to scale phi in two dimensions. It's dimensionless in two dimensions, but in general, there's a factor of d minus 2 over 2 times this vial factor. So if I supplement my vial transformation with this rule for the scalar, the claim is that there's a particular value for C, which I'm going to ask you to determine, to determine in this exercise for which this action is, is, uh, is vial scaling invariant. All right. So even though it's classically invariant, the theory is going to have an anomaly, which uh, by a slight abuse of notation, I'll, I'll call it with, with various nomenclature, I'll call it a scale or vial or trace anomaly. And for the purposes of this lecture, it's all basically the same thing. So the trace anomaly. What, what, where, does this, where does this particular word come from? Why am I calling it a trace anomaly? Well, let's think about the definition of the stress tensor. So one very nice definition of a stress tensor in a curved spacetime is uh, the response of the system to a variation of the metric. So if I have the response of my action, it's going to be integral d dx. Again, the square root of the determinant of g. I'll drop the determinant, but it's implicit, uh, t mu nu delta g mu nu, and I think conventionally there's also a factor of a half here. So this is my definition of my, of my stress tensor, t mu nu. Now, for vial variations, if it's a classically a symmetry, uh, then delta s should vanish. And, but, but I also have a particular form for what this delta g mu nu should be. It should be, uh, what should it be? It should be 2 omega g mu nu. That's the infinitesimal shift in the metric under this, this vial rescaling. So if I go ahead and I plug, I plug that back into my definition of the stress tensor, what do I find? I find that classical vial invariance implies 
that the trace of the stress tensor vanishes. T mu, mu equals zero. And there really is sort of a classical symmetry, classical discussion we could have here that be uh, go on for, for, for quite some time. But let me, let me just point out in passing that, you know, there's also another current here we could define that's associated with the symmetry. We could write J mu is a space-time point X mu contracted with the stress tensor. And indeed that's conserved. Like if I take a derivative now, so this is the sort of flat limit of this discussion, then what do I find? I find uh, a Kronecker delta plus X nu T mu D nu mu. And so what do I find? I find the, the trace of the stress tensor plus the divergence of the stress tensor, but we know the stress tensor should be conserved for diffeomorphism invariant theories. And so here's the flat space uh, restatement of the fact of you know, what the Noether current is for this, this vial invariant theory. So this is just an aside to maybe try and tie things into what you're a little bit more familiar with from a, from a quantum field theory course and you know, the consequences of having classical symmetries. Okay, so this is all aside. So this is what this trace anomaly is and how it connects into the scale, scaling symmetry and vial invariance that we talked about on the previous page. Let's get back to our scalar in 2D to keep things nice and simple. Right, so I have my scalar action, one half integral d2x determinant g d mu phi d mu phi. And I want to try and show you an anomalous aspect or a, a, where this anomaly comes from or, or a way to, way to kind of identify it. So in order to do that, I want to put this theory on a sphere, on an S2 of radius r, zero, to distinguish it from the Ricci scalar. And this is going to be a quantum theory, so we have to compute a partition function. So here's my partition function, or my path integral. Integrate over all field configurations, e to the minus s which implicitly is a functional of my scalar field phi. And this is gonna be Euclidean so that everything is nice and well-defined or at least better defined. We'll see in a minute that there's an issue with this. Okay, so let's try and do this path integral on the sphere. Just like we did the path integral or we, we, we identified the spectrum on this, this, this uh, bead on a wire from, from before. Okay, so I have Laplacian on a sphere. I wanna identify the eigenmodes but we know these, right? The eigenmodes on a sphere are just the spherical harmonics, these YLMs, which have the eigenvalues, which are the eigenvalues of the angular momentum operator for SO3. So box is really nothing but your friend L squared from quantum mechanics, and lambda is nothing but L times L plus one, and we'll be a little bit careful about minus signs and the scale. We have to introduce the radius of the sphere, but that's what it is. And L is what you think, it's just zero, one, two, it's the angular momentum quantum number. And of course there's the degeneracy, there's an M as well. M can run from minus L to L. And so for each L, there's a degeneracy to L plus one, right? Good, so we decompose our field into modes, these L and M modes. We have some coefficients L, M, C, L, M, and our eigenfunctions L, M, which I guess are gonna be a functions of our angles. We don't need to worry too much about their explicit form, but they're the, you know, they're the YLMs, the spherical harmonic functions. So Z now is what? It's a path integral, which I can convert into an integral over all these coefficients, a D, C, L, M, product over L and M, E to the minus a half, sum on L and M. And now I'm using the fact that all those eigenfunctions are orthogonal to reduce it to a sum over L, M squared. Uh, and then I have this energy, L, L plus one. And there was a factor of R squared as well, but that should cancel against the determinant uh, in the integral, right? I also have this determinant. So what I get right is just the C squared. It's a real field. I don't need to worry about absolute value, or at least let's be, let's be sloppy about it. Um, and so this is, this is what's left. And now we'll do the Gaussian integral and we'll write this as a product over our L and M modes, two pi over L times L plus one. So often what people write is not the partition function itself, but it's log or minus its log. We'll give that uh, quantity uh, a letter W, an effective action. And if I take a log of this thing, what do I find? I find one half sum on L. I've got my degeneracy now because, you know, there's two L plus one values of the energy that are all the same. And I have a log of what was in the square root before L times L plus one over two pi. Great. 
So that's my answer. And it's clearly sick, right? This is, a, this is a clearly a divergent uh, quantity, but like we did in the quantum mechanics example for scattering, we'd like to make some sense of it, to try and extract some physics. And I claim there is physics here to be extracted, and we'll get to that as we go forward. All right, so let's copy that and do our best to uh, figure out what this, what this sum means. So the first thing I want to do um, is uh, rewrite that log in a, in a a slightly tricky way. This is a way people often call it the heat kernel method. Um, it's sort of a tried and true way of trying to evaluate these kinds of uh, these kinds of divergent sums. So I've got integral. I'm going to replace that log with an integral from zero to infinity dt over t e to the minus l t plus e to the minus l plus one t. So I claim that evaluates back to the log where possibly I've uh, discarded some constants, some infinite constants, but I'm, I'm not, not interested in those. And then next, what I'd like to do is I'd like to commute the sum and the integral, which is probably not a very safe thing to do since everything is kind of divergent, but let's do it anyway. Uh, and then I claim we can do that, that sum. That sum is just sort of a geometric series and, or a derivative of a geometric series. And so I get dt over t, e to the t, plus one e to the t minus one squared. And now I want to evaluate this somehow. It's still sick. I mean, I think the, you can sort of see that the, the limits um, as t goes off to infinity and t goes to zero, there's some log or power law divergences, uh, but it is what it is. We're gonna do our best. So what we're interested in is we're interested in the UV behavior, which I claim is dominated by the t goes to zero limit. Why do I say that? Well, be, because when if you, if you look at this this initial uh, this initial rewriting, right, as uh, as t goes to zero, the uh, the larger and larger values of l get to contribute more. They're not killed off as fast, and the larger values of l correspond to higher harmonics. They correspond to higher energy states, and so it's the UV of the theory. Whereas large t would cancel the high l's very quickly, and so it would be dominated by the IR limit of this system. So I'm interested in the UV limit, just like we were in the case of this 2D scattering in quantum mechanics. So in that limit, there's a power law divergence, goes as one over t squared, and then there's a log divergence, and then there's finite bits. This is a small t expansion of the integrand. And I claim that uh, this piece doesn't really contain any physical information. It's you know, regulator dependent. It's very sensitive to how we set up the theory. But this one third, on the other hand, does contain physical information. So let's let's think about that. So this is our this is our result. Let's call it W. Let's copy it to the next page. Where is the physics in this T? So this T inverse, I claim I can think of as the radius of the sphere times this UV cutoff that I've added in. Small t is the UV behavior, so large one over t should also be UV behavior. And so by cutting off at small t, I'm introducing some UV regulator, some UV mass regulator. Okay, so if I plug that in uh, to what's going on above, I'm going to find minus 2 r naught squared lambda uv squared minus one third log r naught lambda uv plus finite terms. And so now there's an explicit scale dependence in this theory that wasn't there before. Remember, I just put in the radius of the sphere by hand. And now to make sense of this partition function, I also have to inter introduce not just this ir scale, which is the radius of the sphere, but a uv scale as well. And so what I'm finding here is that the partition function has a scale dependence that lambda uh, uv times the derivative lambda uv acting on the log of the partition function is minus a third. That's, that's this particular term here, whereas uh, this guy here I claim I can, I can remove. Just like I was removing things in that first example of the, of the bead on the wire where I had that integral a, which was a counter term. Here there's a, a slightly different counter term I can add. I can add integral d2x uh, square root g um, with some arbitrary coefficient. So in our earlier example, we called it k. Let's call it k again. I can tune this k to cancel this term here. Now both scale uh, with the radius squared of the, of the sphere, right? This is some sort of volume term for the sphere. And to make it dimensionless, I need k to go as some uv cutoff. And so I can tune k to be lambda uv squared and cancel that piece here. But there's no way I can add that counter term to cancel that piece. That's the claim. That the coefficient here 
uh, means something. I can shift what's inside the log by some by something that will just shift everything by an overall constant, but the, the one-third multiplying the log has a, has a physical meaning. That's our anomaly. So more generally, for 2D theories that are vile invariant, what we expect is the following. We expect lambda d lambda of w be minus c over 24 pi. So the, the, the choice of normalization here, that 24 pi is just purely convention. You'll see why I might have chosen it in a minute. This is the Ricci scalar because it doesn't have that naught square root of the determinant d2x. So again, this is the Ricci scalar, no longer the radius of the sphere. Okay, so let's see what happens for us, for our scalar field on the S2. So the uh, Ricci scalar should be 2 over r naught squared for an S2. And the volume of our S2 should be 4 pi r naught squared, so the r's are not, the radius factors cancel out. And this whole thing evaluates then to minus c over 3, which if I compare with my result on the previous page, means that c equals 1. c equals 1 for a free scalar. So that's why the, we chose the normalization we, the way we did, so that the free scalar would have c equals 1. This often gets rephrased in a local form, so not as an integral, that the trace of the stress tensor if I vary this effective action with respect to you know, rescalings of the metric, I should get the trace uh, that this should go as c over 24 pi times the Ricci scalar. So that's a sort of standard result for 2D conformal field theories or 2D file invariant theories. Okay, so why is this such a big deal? Why do people care about this? What can you get from it? Well, let, let, let's follow this a little bit further. So, so far what I've told you is what the scale variation of the, uh, of the action is. And, um, Let's try and find out what maybe, can we find out maybe what the effective action itself is, the, the action itself that, that, that governs the anomaly. Can we integrate this expression for the derivative of w? Because that might tell us all sorts of stuff about correlation functions, right? This, this effective action is a, a useful tool for generating correlation functions. And indeed in this 2D case, it is possible to integrate w to get this anomaly effective action, which is going to tell us all kinds of interesting things about correlation functions, in particular of the stress tensor. So w claim I can integrate this, I'm going to get c over 24 pi. I'll just give you the answer, and you can sort of go backwards and see how it must work. r times tau minus d tau squared. Now what is this tau? Why did I introduce it? Well, it turns out that the effective action itself is, is, is non-local, and so it's useful to make, or to give it a local presentation by introducing this additional massless field tau, often called the dilaton. And we can see how this gives us the right answer if we uh, invoke the following transformation rule. So if we rescale g mu nu by e to the 2 sigma g mu nu, we rescale tau by tau plus sigma, and then I'll leave you to derive this. The Ricci scalar should transform as e to the minus 2 sigma r minus 2 box sigma. So this is something, again, special about 2D and higher dimensions. The transformation rule is a bit more complicated for the Ricci scalar. But if I have these in hand, I can see uh, quite clearly that uh, the vial variation of this effective action gives me the right answer, what I had before. This d2x root g r delta sigma. And how do I see that? Well, let, let's just look. I mean, basically this whole term comes from the tau variation of the first term. If I, if I vary r, I get box sigma. And if I vary this d tau, I get a, a, a tau plus sigma term. And so you can sort of see that the, the box sigma tau term from the first piece will cancel the after integration by parts, a d tau d sigma term in the, in the second piece. And so it's, it's, it's fairly straightforward to get back and forth from, or at least to get back from this expression to the variation. The, proper variation. It's like a differential equation. Once you found the solution, you can check that it's right. It doesn't matter how you found it. Although there are various constructive ways to, to, to make these things, I, I, won't, I won't go through that here. So this is the answer. And now again, you're saying, well, what is this dilaton? Do we really need it there? Well, let's try and get rid of it and see what happens. So the equation of motion for the dilaton is what it's two box tau, if I've done this right, is equal to minus r or more particularly tau by abuse of notation is minus a half one over box times r. So if I plug that back up into the effective action, what I'm going to find is that w is c over 24 pi. I think there's a factor of minus a quarter, although I could have fooled myself, d2x 
square root g r one over box r. So that fact I have a, a one over box there is is telling me it's 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 non-local. And this is a name. This is often called the Polyakov action in conformal field theory. And it's it's quite interesting that it it's going to generate now the anomalous behavior in all stress tensor correlation functions. Just by varying this with respect to the metric, you should find the you know this the way in which all these stress tensor correlation functions break scale invariance. And in fact, it, it, it makes sense even to claim that it generates all of these stress tensor correlation functions completely, because it turns out in, in these 2D contexts, all of the stress tensor correlation functions are fixed once you know the central charge C, once you know this, this number C. So there's a sense in which this, this effective action tells you everything about the stress tensor sector of your 2D theory. So, remarks. It's a sense in which W generates all t mu nu correlation functions, and not just in flat space, but in, in, on a general metric. And in particular, it's going to generate the one-point function on a general metric. And this is closely related to this uh, Schwarzian derivative. You know, from this, from this action, I'll leave this as an, as an exercise, from this action you can, show, you can show how t mu nu transforms under Weyl transformations. So if you have the stress tensor in one frame, then you can find it in all other frames that are related to the, the original metric by some vial transformation. And then I'll give you one last cute example. So we know that we can put a field theory at non-zero temperature by wrapping the time direction on a, on a Euclidean circle. And so this, this Schwarzian derivative business can be used uh, to show how the energy density of one of these theories behaves. Uh, that it's going to go as the central charge C times the temperature squared over 6. And again, you, you do this by going to a metric where the time direction is, is compactified. And that periodicity of the time direction gives you, gives you the temperature. So in this particular case, this effective action and, and knowledge of the central charge C gives you an enormous amount of information about this 2D theory. So you, see, you begin to see some of the power uh, behind this uh, anomaly approach to uh, a quantum field theory. Okay, so my last and final example, which is coming right up, is going to be QFT with a boundary. So now in this last and final example, I would like to uh, talk about some physics that's uh, very close to the research that I've been, been doing uh, in, in recent years. And in fact, the particular result I'm going to discuss today you can find in, in a paper we wrote about three years ago. I think it's a very nice example, and uh, I, I hope you do too. So QFT with a boundary. So we're going to let this 2D uh, system that we had in the previous example now be a surface or boundary uh, in some larger 3D system. So we're going to let the 2D surface be a boundary of a 3D system. And we're going to ask, what is this anomalous variation of the effective action now? What could it be? And now, to try and figure out what it must be, we're going to use a very powerful criterion, which was uh, invoked by Wess and Zemino first, I guess. So this is called wess Zemino consistency in honor of them. They used it in the case of these uh, gauge theory anomalies in, in non-abelian symmetry groups, where it's actually a little bit more intricate because things are non-commuting. For us, it's, it's, it's particularly simple uh, because this vial variation, these delta sigmas, they generate an abelian group. And so it must be that if we take two of these uh, vial variations, it doesn't matter which order we take them in, whichever order we take them in, we should get the same thing. And so they should commute, their action should commute. Uh, and the other thing we want to do to kind of constrain what this anomalous variation which should be, we're going to use local counter terms, just like we've been using up to this point, to you know, separate what's physical from what's not. We're going to use local counter terms uh, in W. Uh, to simplify the anomalous scale variation. So if we find some you know, variation uh, that looks particularly complicated, sometimes we can get rid of some of that. Just like we saw in the case of the scalar field on a sphere a few moments ago, we can use these local counter terms to get rid of some of that extra stuff. So this is going to be a scale invariant or vial invariant theory, at least classically. And we can in invoke that now because it means the possible stuff that can appear in the scale variation is rather limited. So we're going to construct words from the metric. And now that this uh, 2D system is a surface, we also have a normal derivative, a, a normal vector. And we'll, we'll make sure it's uh, unit normalized, so n squared is 1. We're going to construct words from uh, the metric and this normal vector. 
that are second order in derivatives, because otherwise we need some dimensional constant, which we don't have, because if, if we had it, then the theory wouldn't be scale invariant. Like if we had a mass, then that would set some scale, the theory wouldn't be scale invariant. So we're forced to look uh, for some anomalous variations in things that are second order in derivatives. Okay, so we're thinking about this 2D system now as a boundary. So let's develop a little bit more formalism for this. So we need some sort of notion of a boundary metric. Uh, really, it's gonna be a projector, at least in the context of the current rather crude discussion. So I'm gonna have a boundary metric, which is the ordinary metric minus the normal derivatives. And since it's a surface, I, I can also talk about extrinsic curvature. It's another useful uh, gadget to work with that has nice covariance properties. So the extrinsic curvature I can define as a projected version of a covariant derivative of this normal vector. So it has only tangential indices, the extrinsic curvature. So these are some ingredients that go into this construction. And now what's my word list? Well, what can I write down? I have a, I've got a 2D Ricci scalar like I did before. So that's probably still gonna be there. I can construct things that are quadratic in the extrinsic curvature, or I could take a trace of the extrinsic curvature first. So by K, I just mean K mu nu, H mu nu, so traced over the tangential directions. Um, what else can I do? Well, I could have K and then a normal derivative. Um, I could have two normal derivatives, and I could have, say, a normal derivative acting on the extrinsic curvature. You know, everywhere here, I should also have my little vial variation parameter sigma. So some of these terms, I've got derivatives acting on sigma, other terms I don't. And I'll just point out that the places where I, I don't have a, a, a derivative acting on sigma, so these guys, these are good candidates for counter terms because I could add those to the original action without this extra vial parameter sigma and think about vial variations of those uh, to remove terms from partial sigma of the effective action. Oh, and I missed one here. There's one more here I should write down. Uh, I can think about a, a two-dimensional Laplacian acting on sigma as well. So let's see, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven terms that are second order in derivatives uh, that could show up in the vial variation of the effective action, the anomalous vial variation of the effective action. So in other words, well, let's copy it since I've run out of room. So in other words, delta sigma w should be a sum of these words, or could be a sum of these words. We have got to figure it out. So before I go forward, I want to uh, simplify um, my life a little bit, and I want to introduce a, a traceless version of the extrinsic curvature. So in, in our particular case, this is just a, a, a two-dimensional boundary, so there's a factor of a half there. And I'll, I'll trade uh, the appearance of the extrinsic curvature here for the traceless one in my words uh, moving forward. So there's some tedious work to do, uh, you know, figuring out what the vial variation does to all of these terms. And I'll, I'll leave a lot of it as an exercise to see that, uh, I mean, we're going to be varying these covariant derivatives, so we need, ha need to know how to vary the connection. So we need to know that this is some derivatives acting on the vial, ter vial parameter. Uh, we need to know how vial variation acts on the normal derivatives. These are all infinitesimal vial variations, so sigma is a small parameter in all of this, minus sigma and mu. So the fact that you have to contract with the metric is going to shift the sign there. I need to know how delta k shifts. So that leading term is just the fact that it's a, a first-order derivative, but then there's some derivative pieces that make my life a little bit miserable here. It means it's not completely covariant in the way it shifts. So that's, that's three of them, and then we can keep going. I need also... Uh, the, the trace, the variation of the trace is minus sigma k plus 2n lambda d lambda sigma. The, I need the trace, uh, the variation of the Ricci scalar. This is the two-dimensional Ricci scalar, minus 2 sigma r minus 4 box sigma. I need to know that the variation of the 2d box is just minus 2 sigma. So it's covariant, and I think that's it. So you've got to do all these sort of building block uh, calculations to see what's going on. And then from this, we can, we can find the following uh, transformation rules for these words that we had in, in the potential uh, anomaly action. So we're going to see now that delta sigma of k squared, and I don't really care about constants here. Let's just sort of see the general structure. So this is going to give me a k and then a n mu d mu sigma, just based on what we had on the top line there. And from the previous page, so if we, if we vary uh, something with a normal derivative acting on k, 
uh, then I think we get it. I get the same thing back after commuting some derivatives through the normal vectors, and we also get a second normal derivative. And so, so what we're seeing now from this is that uh, we can cancel. So the claim is that if this term showed up in the anomaly effective action, we could cancel it by adding a counter term of the form k squared. And if uh, this second derivative showed up in the anomaly effective action, we could cancel it by adding some combination of these two terms. So we don't expect to see either this piece or this word in the anomaly effective action. We can cancel them by counter terms. And another thing to note is that, uh, you know, you could wonder now, could these terms k squared and n mu d mu k themselves show up in, in d sigma w? And the answer is they can't because when we vary them, if these things showed up themselves, they would involve normal derivatives acting on sigma. And so they wouldn't be West, uh, they wouldn't be West amino consistent. We couldn't integrate by parts to make the two sigmas appear in a symmetric way. One would appear with a normal derivative, one wouldn't, and their commutator wouldn't vanish. So, you know, by doing this simple computation, we've ruled out all of these possible structures from the anomaly effective action. We've ruled out four of the structures. And another thing we see is if, you know, we have this rule for delta r, we see box sigma showing up on the right-hand side. I mean, the two sigma is just going to cancel against the determinant of the metric. And so this is the piece we have to care about, care about this derivative acting on sigma. And so we see that even though the box sigma is West amino consistent on its own, it can be canceled by a counter term by adding the Ricci scalar itself to the original uh, effective action. And so if we look back at our original list on the previous page, uh, it, it boils down to something uh, fairly simple. We've, you know, we've gone and we've basically uh, not allowed ourselves to have this term, this term, this term, uh, this term, or this term in the uh, anomaly effective action. We're just left with two possibilities, uh, this k hat squared piece and r sigma. And indeed, we can, we can look at that now and see if this makes sense. So we're left with only this 2D Ricci scalar times sigma and this traceless version of the extrinsic curvature uh, times sigma for the anomaly effective action. That del sigma of W is integral D2x square root G, A, R, 2D, where that A is some constant, and then B, k hat mu nu, k hat mu nu, sigma. Right, so let's think about these two bits and see whether this is really a consistent uh, effective action. Doesn't look like we can cancel any of it uh, with counter terms. Uh, is it West amino consistent? That's the question. So this piece is going to transform to A sigma box sigma prime, where this is the 2D box. So we can integrate that by parts. And so it looks West amino consistent uh, provided A is constant. Provided A is constant, we can integrate by parts and we can make the sigma and sigma prime uh, appear in a, in a symmetric way. And so the order of operations here, whether we act with sigma or sigma prime first, it doesn't matter. And this guy, this k hat squared term, uh, it turns out to be vial invariant or vial covariant, you, if you will, on its own. And so it's sort of trivially uh, West amino consistent because the second variation just vanishes. And so it doesn't matter whether you symmetrize or not. It, doesn't give you anything. So these are the two pieces that appear in the anomaly for a 2D boundary of a 3D system that starts out being vial invariant. This is the, the boundary anomaly uh, for a 2D uh, vial invariant boundary in a 3D system. So I'll, I'll give you an exercise. It's to consider, um, it's actually not massless now, it's conformally coupled 3D scalar field on a hemisphere, 3D hemisphere, and you're instructed to use both Neumann, there's two cases to consider, so use both Neumann and Dirichlet boundary conditions. Uh, compute the partition function like we did for the scalar field on an S2 and uh, extract from this the A coefficient. You don't have to worry about B in this case since we're working on a hemisphere, the extrinsic curvature on that uh, you know, equator is gonna vanish. And so there will be no contribution from this B uh, term to the anomaly in this case, and you can use the hemisphere to, to, to figure out what A is in these two, two cases. So it's a rather challenging example, but it follows along the same line as this uh, massless scalar field on an S2, and so I hope you can, if you're, uh, if you're ambitious, you can, you, can, you can work your way to the end of it. Now for B, we need a little more development than I provided so far, so let's, let's back up. 
and talk a little bit about uh, some aspects of uh, these uh, 3D con violin variant systems with 2D boundaries. In particular, I need to introduce a concept uh, that's called the displacement operator. Okay, so fresh page for that. We're almost at the end here. Just got two more pages in my notes uh, and one more exercise, and then, it, then it's done. So here's my variation of my effective action. I have a 3D bulk with a, a metric. And as we discussed before, we can define the stress tensor as the response of the system to a variation in the metric. And now I also have a 2D boundary, and you can ask, here's my 2D metric on the boundary, what is the response of the system to a variation of the location of the boundary? This is the location of the boundary, and this response has a name. This is what's called the displacement operator. So you, the, the, the location of the boundary is a source for the displacement operator. So I want to consider two kinds of symmetries in this system. We'll consider bulk diffeomorphisms. So changes of variable under which x mu goes to x mu plus some small displacement that's a function of position. And we know under this kind of transformation that the metric varies as covariant derivatives of this displacement, epsilon. And the stress tensor is typically conserved, but in this case, uh, because we have this displacement operator uh, and because x varies, the location of the var boundary varies in response to diffeomorphisms. There's a, there's a spoilage here of uh, conservation of the stress tensor. There's a delta function that lo localizes on the boundary. And what I find here on the right-hand side is the displacement operator. So the displacement operator has a, another definition, if you will. It's the failure of, as sort of the failure of uh, translation invariance. So that's bulk. And I also want to consider boundary boundary diffios. So I have some coordinate system on the boundary u, ua plus kappa au. And under a change of variables now, I'm going to shift. Under these diffeomorphisms, x will shift in the following way. And so what is this implied? It implies that uh, ka dax mu d mu equals zero. These diffeomorphisms only affect the boundary term. And this thing that's multiplying the displacement operator, this is purely tangential, right? There's no way for the diffeomorphisms on the boundary to affect the bulk. And so this also implies that the displacement operator only has one component here, has only a normal component. What do I have here now? I have d mu t mu nu is delta of xn d nu. And this is only non-zero for nu equals n. The only non-zero component is the, the normal component. And there's a little sort of Gaussian pillbox argument uh, you can uh, run for this. We'll show you yet one more way of thinking about the displacement operator in this context. So if I take the boundary limit of the normal normal component of the stress tensor, that is also the displacement operator, which is a useful fact for doing the last exercise I'm going to assign. Uh, you can use the stress tensor to the boundary limit of the stress tensor to define the displacement operator. It's, it's like that um, problem one does in electricity and magnetism where you have a charged capacitor plate and uh, you can relate the, the, the normal component of the electric field to the charge density on the plate. It's basically the same computation. Okay, so let's try to relate this B coefficient to something about the displacement operator if we can. That'll be our last, last goal in these lectures and then we will wrap things up. So I'm going to consider the, dis, uh, consider the extrinsic curvature, which we said was the covariant derivative of the normal vector. And we want to do this for a nearly flat boundary. So xn, we'll put the boundary at xn equals zero. And that will be basically where the boundary is up to small corrections. And because of that, the normal vector takes the following form. It's going to have a one in the normal direction. And then all the other components are just small, these small derivatives of uh, the normal coordinate uh, with respect to the, uh, the tangential directions of the embedding. So this thing at the top, this is the capital X, and this is a lowercase x. So what does this imply? From our definition of the extrinsic curvature, this is going to imply that KAB, the, the tangential components of the extrinsic curvature, I can write at least approximately as a Hessian of this normal embedding coordinate. And moreover, this uh, vial invariant k hat squared, if I expand it all out, it's at least approximately d squared xn dxa dxb minus a half delta ab, the 2d box, which is basically just a Laplacian. This whole thing squared, and if, if I work this whole thing out, this is basically xn 
box squared 2d xn after possibly some integration by parts. Okay, so that's a nice uh, simple expression for this uh, vial invariant k hat squared uh, in the presence of a nearly flat boundary. And I hope you can see where I'm going with this. The idea is to have re-expressed it in terms of this embedding coordinate so I can then make a connection with the displacement operator. So if I go back to my anomalous variation of the action, the b term here I can write now as b over 2 integral d2x xn box squared 2d xn, which implies that I'm also going to get an anomalous variation of the two-point function for the displacement operator. If I just vary the above expression twice with respect to xn, that's going to give me the two-point function. And so what is this? This is b over 2 box squared 2d delta 2 of x. Almost there. Now, I note the following thing about the displacement operator in a vial invariant or a conformally invariant theory, that it's determined by the symmetries. So here I'm basically in half of flat space. It's determined by, this, by conformal symmetries to be a, a number divided by uh, the, the distance between the insertions up to the fourth power is fixed by conformal invariance. So I effectively have some kind of like 2D conformal field theory living on this surface. And the correlation functions of operators that are restricted to that surface have to obey those symmetry properties. And now to get at the relation between B and CDD, I'm going to use some tricks. Uh, it's sometimes called real space renormalization. So what we'll do is the following. We're going to rewrite 1 over x to the fourth in terms of logarithms as a third power of box log lambda squared x squared squared. And there's our scale dependence entering. This implies lambda d lambda 1 over x to the fourth is pi over 32 box 2d delta of 2x. We just follow our nose here basically. We're using, I mean, we, we take the lambda derivative, that's straightforward to do, but we're also using the fact that uh, the Laplacian acting on a log in two dimensions is a direct delta function. This is a fact that you may have come across originally in electricity and magnetism, that, you know, wires make log potentials, but um, it's important here for developing this connection. And so now, now we're basically done because we, we, we have a way of uh, introducing or identifying some uh, scale dependence in this uh, correlation function. People often talk about how the fact that, you know, at, at x equals zero, it's not well defined. There's an infinity that you need some way of regulating it. And this is a sort of partial way of regulating it by introducing this lambda. And now by comparing the scale variation of the one over x to the fourth with the vial variation um, of the action up top, uh, we at last get a relation between b and c. And that's, that's where I'll end things with the fact that pi c d d over 32 is equal to b over 2. So there it is. That's my last example. And uh, thanks for bearing with me so far. I almost forgot to give you my last exercise. So let me do that before we wrap up. This is an exercise to compute this uh, central charge B in a simple case. So consider a conformally coupled uh, scalar field in three dimensions. So that's that action I gave you as a previous exercise uh, from a, a few minutes back. Uh, let's do this on a flat half space, so the boundary will be flat. And let's also specify both Dirichlet and Neumann boundary conditions. So there's sort of two subcases to consider. One subcase with Dirichlet, and one subcase with Neumann boundary conditions. And you'll have to see whether the answer is the same or different in each case. Okay, so what I'd like you to do then is compute the displacement two-point function in, these, in, in both of these cases. And from the coefficient of this function, it's fixed up to one number by conformal invariance. Uh, from the coefficient of that number, uh, determine b. And there'll be an intermediate step here. There'll be an intermediate step uh, where you're going to have to compute or at least this is the way I did it, compute the normal normal component of the stress tensor, of the improved stress tensor. So that's the exercise. Let's see how you do with it. Okay, so that brings me to the end. Uh, let's just wrap up and sum up what we've done in this rather long lecture. We've considered four examples of anomalies. Our first example was a bead on a circular wire. Uh, this was an example of a tuft anomaly, an anomaly that showed up once you introduced uh, external gauge fields. And I mentioned in passing that it's a nice example to build intuition for more complicated examples. 
uh, more complicated examples with actual practical interest, like uh, uh, the theta angle in Yang Mills theory. Our second example was scattering off a attractive delta function in 2D quantum mechanics. It had to be two-dimensional or else I didn't have a scaling symmetry, classical scaling, scaling symmetry. And we saw, we saw this was a, 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 a quantum mechanical example of a scale anomaly. And then we had two quantum field theory examples. We, we discussed the trace anomaly uh, for a 2D massless scalar field, a relatively famous example. And then finally, I discussed some more recent work about boundary trace anomalies. So this is a quantum field theory now with a boundary. You can have a, a purely boundary contribution to the anomaly. And we focused mostly on a 3D, 2D system. So I've, you know, I've shied away from precise definitions in, in this lecture, instead focusing attention on examples. And I, I chose these examples, so I hope uh, that I could develop some better intuitive sense of what an anomaly is. That's what I hope you'll leave this lecture with, is a, a better intuitive sense of, of what is an anomaly. So thanks for your attention. Thank mm -hmm. you.